Uh, so first, uh, I introduce the Chris. So Chris is a Harvard assistant professor at MGH, and his research focused on the strategies to chemically modulate gene regulatory factors. He was postdoctoral fellow at, uh, in Jay Bradner Group at Dana Faber, and his work has been recognized by several awards, including NIH uh, Pathway to Independen Independence Award, as well as American Society of, of Hematology. Uh, it's great to have you, Chris, here, uh, and we are very much looking for a seminar. Thanks, Nikolai. Thanks so much for the introduction, and I'm, I'm super happy to um, be invited to present uh, to this, uh, this community today um, around some, some new chemistry uh, that we've been working on in my group, um, developing heterobifunctional protac-based degraders of, of two proteins we're really interested in, the, the CBP and P300 acetyltransferases. Um, and before I'll start, I'll, I'll uh, like to say that this uh, seminar series has been really uh, a, a true blessing the past couple of years, um, both for my group and I know for this research community. Um, so congratulations to all of you for, for putting this uh, outstanding um, community together. Um, I think um, uh, I'd also, of course, like to mention that I'm a, I'm a proud alumnus of the, the postdoctoral training program at, at Dana-Farber. Um, and all of the work that we do in my lab, um, the work that I'll present today has um, all sort of germinated uh, during my time as a postdoc in, in Jay Bradner's lab. Um, and all of these folks in this picture uh, contributed in some way to the sort of scientific formation of my own group. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll point out Jun Chi, who uh, was leading a lot of the chemistry efforts in the lab and is now on faculty over there, um, who I owe a lot to in terms of my development as a chemical biologist um, uh, uh, and, and is, remains a good friend. Um, and then also, you know, you know, the project that I'll present is all about uh, some heterobifunctional degraders that we've been synthesizing in the lab, which is work that all sort of um, was inspired by both uh, uh, Georg Winter and, and Dennis Buckley and their sort of seminal work back when I was in the lab on, on developing thalidomide-based degraders for um, the, the BET proteins. Uh, and of course, Jay, who was a, a, a fantastic mentor during my time over there. Um, my lab is now located right across town. I moved over here several years ago uh, to set up a chemical biology lab. We're about four years old now. Um, and uh, we're largely focused on using genetic chemical tools to perturb uh, components of the gene regulatory, gene regulatory machinery that are uh, active at enhancers. Um, and so we have a number of different sort of scientific disciplines and, and areas that we use to pursue this uh, area of biology, of cancer biology, both mapping enhancers in cancer cells and primary tumors and trying to understand the differences between um, normal enhancer mediated gene regulation and, and, and oncogenic enhancer mediated um, gene regulation, developing chemical tools to selectively and, and, and actively perturb these systems. Um, and then also to do um, pharmacogenomic and perhaps pharmacoepigenomic work to truly try and understand how the new molecules that target these types of machineries may actually potentially be used clinically um, uh, with different genetic or perhaps even epigenetic biomarkers to enable their development. Um, our research is um, funded by a number of different groups. We have active uh, uh, collaborations with several, several uh, for-profit enterprises um, listed here, um, but none of the projects that I'll, I'll be discussing today um, uh, uh, have been supported by these groups. So I first wanna just start with uh, um, recognizing that it's been 40 years uh, since Walter Schaffner really established the idea of uh, the oncogenic enhancer. Um, here first mapping and identifying uh, the immunoglobulin enhancer in myeloma cells and as being really a cell type specific and a cancer cell type specific gene regulatory element. Um, and I find it very prescient that he was, um, he and his group, uh, you know, mentioned in this first paper that enhancers are integrally involved both in normal and abnormal 
uh, oncogenic uh, development in, uh, in eukaryotic cells. And of course, this has been proven over and over again with more advanced studies um, in tumor epigenomics, um, where over and over again, we see uh, both somatic and epigenomic um, alterations in almost every different tumor type. Um, that involve enhancers. Um, and so it stands to reason that uh, targeting these with therapeutics, with chemical probes, um, is an important step towards um, figuring out ways to uh, selectively target these uh, type of oncogenic events. And the, the area of, of chemistry and biochemistry that um, we've been focusing on is uh, an aspect of enhancers um, that is sort of uh, universally appreciated and that they are very highly acetylated. And there's a lot of dynamic machinery, protein machinery that are involved in maintaining the dynamic acetylation uh, at enhancers. Um, uh, this acetylation largely occurs on lysines, both on histones um, and non-histone proteins. Um, these uh, acetylation events are largely mediated um, and written by lysine acetyltransferases. They're erased by uh, histone deacetylases, um, and they're read uh, 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 by um, uh, bromodomain modules. Um, these protein domains are found in lots of different uh, uh, families and, and proteins within the human genome, um, and they're druggable. They're drug dr clearly druggable components um, uh, of the enhancer own. Um, and some of them, uh, specifically HDAC inhibitors, have been really been successfully translated in the clinic for a number of different um, uh, tumor, tumor types. Um, and bromodomain inhibitors are following in that lead. Uh, acetyltransferase uh, inhibitors are also starting to emerge as um, uh, potentially viable uh, pharmacology for targeting these, um, uh, these elements. And so perhaps the um, uh, some of the most interesting, I would say, uh, proteins that are involved with these dynamic acetylation ad enhancers are, the, are these massive proteins called CBP and P300. These have been understood to dynamically regulate lysine acetylation through their cat domain and enhancers for several decades now. Um, these are unique proteins that they're massive. They have a number of different functional domains, over 10 of them. Most of them are involved in protein-protein uh, interactions. Um, they also contain a bromo domain, uh, in addition to their acetyltransferase enzymatic uh, activity. Um, they're highly homologous. The domain structures of these proteins are, um, in most cases, over 90% conserved at the amino acid level. Um, through elegant uh, proteomics work by Chuna Chowdhury, um, they're really understood to dynamic, dynamically acetylate over 21,000 lysines, largely surrounding uh, the uh, proteins that interact with enhancers themselves, histones and non-histone proteins, um, over 5,000 of them, in fact. Um, and they are known to be required for establishing enhancer-mediated transcription. In fact, ChIP-seq for P300 um, was used early in the early days of the ENCODE project to, to map active enhancers um, in both human and non-human cells. Um, and as such, they've been connected to different um, uh, uh, aspects of, of uh, oncology and, and, and oncogenes um, for a number of years, uh, and thus have been um, potentially popular drug targets. And so a number of different groups have been developing ligands to target um, mostly either the bromo domain or the acetyl transfer, the acetyl transferase domain. And, um, and of course, you know, it would be a negligent of me to not um, cite, in fact, the, uh, the original cloning of P300, which was done at Dana-Farber. Um, and I know hearts are heavy um, with uh, Professor Livingston's passing uh, a few months ago. Um, I regret that I didn't know him very well when I, during my training time over there, although a pass did cross uh, a few times, and, and it was apparent in those uh, few fleeting interactions how important he was to the institution and, and, and to this field in general. And so um, certainly the work that I'm presenting today is, is standing on the shoulders of giants, including um, Professor Livingston. 
one of the reasons um, that we were particularly interested in potentially making it the greater uh, of these proteins um, is based on two studies, one from Chuna Chowdhury's group in which they really measured at a proteomic level, um, the dynamic acetylation and the differences between um, the dynamic acetylone uh, with treatment of inhibitors, both acetylysine um, or acetyltransferase inhibitors and bromodomain, bromodomain inhibitors. And it's clear that you have very different effects when you perturb these proteins with the bromodomain inhibitor versus an acetyltransferase uh, domain inhibitor at the acetylation level. There's much more specific effects on acetylation. Um, with bromodomain uh, inhibitors, as you can see here. And then from Phil Cole's lab, who actually combined a bromodomain inhibitor with a, a acetyl trans transferase uh, domain inhibitor and showed strong, powerful synergistic effects, uh, anti-proliferative synergistic effects of prostate cancer cell lines that are surmised to be because you're displacing effectively with the combination of the two ligands, uh, the two inhibitors, uh, CBP and P300. Uh, from chromatin itself. So it stands to reason that um, in order to really um, uh, perturb the scaffolding effects of CBP and P300 and to efficiently remove it from enhancers, a degrader approach would be necessary. In cancer, um, using uh, the Broad Institute's DEPMAP um, uh, database, um, we can clearly see that both CBP and P300 are required for the proliferation of a number of different cancer cells, cancer cell types. Um, and interesting to us is at the leading edge of both dependency for P300 and CBP um, uh, are myeloma cell lines, um, showing us that CBP expression and P300 expression seem to be required um, for myeloma cell growth, uh, and that um, effectively ablating both of them uh, uh, with either genetic tools or pharmacologic tools may be required. So um, we had a number of different choices to make as we sort of thought about pursuing chemistry in this area. Um, there are a number of different ligands already developed uh, for both the bromo domain and the cat domain. Um, and we chose to focus our attention on um, a molecule made by Genentech, GNE 8781, um, and a molecule made by AVI, A485, which were at the time we started this chemistry, sort of the, at the leading edge of, 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 of potent and selective ligands for for both of these domains. And we were inspired by work again at the Farber um, from Eric Fisher's group, um, where they had really used sophisticated in silico modeling of the ternary complex with cerebline to sort of uh, map out the possibilities of, 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 of uh, structural dynamics around ternary complex formation with bromonomates in particular. Um, and so we used a similar approach in which we wanted to sort of efficiently design a molecule that didn't, wasn't gonna require a ton of chemistry. Um, so we needed to make a choice whether we would uh, design molecules surrounding the hat domain uh, or the bromine domain, and then which exit vector of these ligands we would um, design molecules around. And so this docking clearly nominated um, this site on the Genentech molecule as perhaps gonna be most efficient at inducing this ternary complex, at least with a uh, linker length of about four pegs or, or uh, uh, about 20 angstroms. And so this is the molecule we synthesized first, we call it DCBP1. It was made by a talented chemist in the lab, Rag Vanham. Um, and again, it, it, it is conjugated off of this site, um, this solvent exposed site of, of this Genentech ligand. Um, with four peg molecule uh, linked to uh, linked to thalidomide. And this molecule is quite potent. I'll breeze through, through this data um, quickly because it, it was published last year in Cell Chemical Biology, but it's, it's quite an active molecule. Um, it degrades both CBP and P300 about equally um, with under you know, 10 nanomolar uh, uh, efficiency. Um, it's quite a fast acting molecule. So within an hour or two, we get complete degradation of both CBP and P300. It's also quite selective. So we do not see any degradation of, of the BET protein BRD2, 3, and 4. In myeloma cells, we see similar dynamics in terms of degradation. And this is true across most of the, of the myeloma cell lines that we see. Um, at a proteomic level, we can confirm that these are quite selective molecules. So um, with Willie Haas's group here, we've done the TMT labeled uh, proteomics experiment to show that with three hours of treatment with DCBP1, we see selective loss of both P300 and CBP without loss of BRD4, um, the Icarose proteins or GSPT1. We also see potent loss of MYC 
um, a likely transcriptional uh, target of both of these proteins. This window is short, however. You know, within six hours, we see lots of proteins going down. As you can imagine, these are very potent transcriptional regulators that regulate a lot of genes. Um, uh, uh, and so that the window of selective and, and particular degradation is, is quite short. In terms of cell viability, we see potent cell killing of uh, uh, a vast number of multiple myeloma cell lines that is um, more pronounced than inhibitors alone, um, especially with the increase in, in, in cell killing activity as exemplified by an increase in, in Emax with treatment of this compound versus the inhibitors alone. At the transcriptional level, again, we see um, MYC is most potently downregulated um, uh, with treatment of DCBP1, um, more so than equi uh, uh, equimolar um, uh, administration of both of the inhibitors of the cat domain and or uh, the bromo domain. At an epigenomic level, we see um, most complete ablation of, of histone acetylation here, looking at the H3K27 acetylation mark with DCBP1. This is six hours of treatment um, at P300 and CBP binding sites. We can see loss of this uh, acetylation mark. Um, what was interesting to us is that um, unique to uh, P300 or, or, or CBP acetylation uh, in, inhibitor events or, or effects, we see almost complete loss of chromatin accessibility. Uh, here showing the aminoglobulin locus that is translocated in this myeloma cell into MYC and, and potently upregulates MYC transcription. Um, this is unique to, uh, uh, to the degrader, it seems, versus um, the acetyltransferase inhibitors. Um, here from Ricky Johnstone's group in a recent paper in which they did uh, a similar experiment with A485, a cat domain uh, acetyltransferase inhibitor, um, uh, in the same cell line at the same time point. You can see there's actually a very minimal effect on chromatin accessibility. P300 and CBP are still sitting on the enhancer and their scaffolding effects presumably um, may still largely be playing a role in maintaining the enhancer structure. Um, with DCBP1 treatment, we see um, a much larger effect on chromatin accessibility and the complete loss of chromatin accessibility at selective enhancers. What transcription factors are affected? Well, we clearly see that the IRF factors um, uh, are seem to be lost uh, uh, from these enhancer elements, at least looking at the transcription factor motifs and the footprints that, it, that uh, exist within those motifs. Um, using a taxic uh, assays. Um, this molecule is active in vivo. Um, uh, I regret that this didn't make it into our index publication, but we can um, see clearly uh, in vivo effects of DCVP1 treatment here in a subcutaneous model of MM1S, um, a multiple myeloma cell line grown um, subcutaneously. This is four hours of treatment of DCVP1. Um, uh, following a single dose, four hours following a single dose at 20 mg per kg. And you can see really by IHC almost complete loss of both CBP and P300. Um, this is a dose that um, can be well tolerated um, when given three times weekly. So we can see a reduction in, in, in tumor pro proliferation when grown subcutaneously and extension over, over, overall survival um, in this cohort of mice with really minimal effects on, uh, uh, on body weight. We've been um, working pretty hard to sort of expand uh, the chemistry around CBP and P300 uh, degraders um, and around DCBP1 to try to achieve several goals. One, to see if we can um, uh, play with the pharmacology of the molecule and, and, and the half-life of the molecule, um, but also to potentially use uh, uh, other E3 ligases to induce degradation of these proteins to see if we can uh, observe bias in CBP degradation versus P300 degradation. In order to uh, facilitate that, we've generated um, these hybrid assays, which have been uh, developed by Promega and have been enormously useful for our group in terms of um, the throughput for our, our assays and really refining the, uh, uh, the degradation kinetics that we can observe uh, with these molecules. And so we have this set up in the HAP1 cell line, a haploid cell line, um, in which we've endogenously tagged either CBP or P300 to monitor um, live cell kinetic degradation. 
So one of the first things that we've done with, um, with our chemistry is actually to go back and address that first question about um, the exit vector of this molecule and whether the modeling that we did um, was actually predictive for the degradation uh, uh, that we observed um, and whether the first molecule that we designed and synthesized was actually uh, going to be the most active and potent molecule. Um, so we went back and we redid the chemistry uh, and we designed um, uh, molecules in which we could access uh, different points um, of this genetech uh, molecule, this genetech ligand, um, with different linkers, um, different linker attachment points. And so we've made the PEG-4 version, the lidomide conjugated versions uh, of these molecules using all three of these different exit vectors that we, that we modeled in our in silico modeling. And, and sure enough, um, at least for this target and, and uh, using Cerebron, the modeling that we did was actually predictive. Um, so you can see that DCBP1 is quite uh, uh, more potent and active than uh, molecules in which we have the same linker length, um, same conjugation to thalidomide strategy, um, but just following a different exit vector, um, either this internal ring, ring system or off of this methyl pyrazole system. Um, we are starting to see with this chemistry a slight bias in P300 degradation um, over CBP. This is very dose specific and, and um, is not broad. And you know, I wouldn't claim that this is a, a selective molecule, um, but we are starting to see it and we were very excited to see it. Um, and then we were very excited to see June's work uh, recently published in which they did the chemistry we didn't do, um, conjugating uh, thalidomide to the hat domain ligand. Um, in which they do see uh, 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 a clear selective effect on P300, um, albeit at a later time point. Um, but we're very excited that, uh, that now with DCBP1 and, and June's JQAD1 molecule, selective for P300 are really robust, along with all the inhibitors that have been, been developed by a number of groups, that there's a really robust toolbox for these proteins um, being developed. We've made VHL conjugated molecules that are quite potent and active. Um, and so uh, it's nice to know that VHL can also be used as an E3 ligase um, to degrade these proteins. In multiple myeloma, this may be of particular importance as, you know, for any sort of particular or, or therapeutic development as, as cerebellum mutations or deletions um, can often occur in the relapsed refractory population of, of myeloma patients uh, who may one day see these types of molecules. Um, and we've been very active in terms of uh, profiling DCBP1 and the analogs that we're making across a broad uh, panel of cancer cell lines. Um, we've been very interested in, in terms of um, trying to understand whether DCBP1 may, you know, a profiling again in cell viability terms may reveal uh, tumor types or cell types that may be um, uh, susceptible to dual CBP P300 degradation that may not be predicted from uh, CRISPR knockout screening. Uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, uh, one thing we are noticing is, you know, we've done this screen and the screen is ongoing where we've, we've uh, shown DCP1 to over 200 cancer cell lines at this point. Um, myeloma cell lines clearly are on the leading edge in terms of, of activity, um, which is gratifying to us. Um, and we also see that uh, we can do analysis such as compare the activity of a VHL conjugated molecule to uh, a cerebron based molecule. And in our hands, um, they're quite um, uh, equipotent across the, and their activity is highly correlated uh, across all these. So moderate potentially uh, expression differences in cerebron or VHL does not seem to um, confer any sort of, um, as, as far as we can tell, any, uh, uh, broad effect in terms of sensitivity or resistance uh, to these molecules. Um, we've also become very interested in trying to understand potential mechanisms of resistance to DCBP1. Um, it's clear that this is not a pantoxic molecule. There are a number of cell lines. In fact, I would argue almost a majority of cell lines that actually don't, um, are relatively unperturbed with five day, in this case, treatment of DCBP1. Um, we're 
fascinated by this and we're trying to understand this, whether this is attenuated degradation um, via any number of mechanisms around how uh, this process works in terms of um, uh, meeting your proteasomal base degradation of, the, of, the, of these molecules through Cerebloc. Um, but we also see contexts such as here with uh, two different prostate cancer lines in which we see complete degradation of both CBP and P300 in both of these lines. Um, and yet the AR negative um, D145 uh, line is, is completely resistant to this. And so we're fascinated by this, how a cell line can um, proliferate and, and, and uh, be resistant to a complete loss of these were thought to be really essential proteins for uh, enhancer activation. Um, we don't have me mechanistic understanding of this yet. We're working on it and trying to understand it. Um, but this is sort of where we're, where we're taking science forward at this point. So with that, I'll stop. I'm going to thank my group, in particular, Ragu Vanum, uh, Sai Dodo, who have led the chemistry efforts um, around this, John, who did the, uh, the molecular modeling, the in silico modeling. Uh, of this, and then Barbara, Sam, and, uh, and Sophie, who have been doing uh, the cell line screening, the epigenomics analysis, and, and um, got the, uh, the Hybit system up and running uh, for us. And then, of course, um, a number of different sources of support for our lab. So thank you, and I'm, 